So welcome everybody, it is another episode of the Before Skynet podcast and this week I am going to do something interesting again as usual, um, always focusing on technology but in this episode we are going to be looking over a video and I'm going to give my commentary on it and one of the main things I want to really get into this is because we haven't as yet realized the potential impact, the real impact of AI. And this is quite a unique interview in the fact that in this video, they actually speak to the open AI CEO and CTO. Now, these are the people that are way up, you know, right at the top of the business. And it's interesting to see and hear what they have to say. Now, please pay attention to their body language on top of this. Um, and we will discuss in more detail what I actually think about it. And I think it would be a good opportunity for you to just take the time out and just listen. And if you don't listen to my commentary, just go and listen to the whole video for yourself. I'll put a link for it in the bio or in the description. And yeah, let's go. This one is a shocker. Trust me. It's got me feeling woo, beside myself. Okay, so let's get started. And I'm going to break it up as I'm going along and we're discussing certain elements of what they've said and what the real reality of it is. So this is open AI CEO and CTO on the risks of how AI will reshape society. Now, there are some questions, some well put together and thought about questions that come up in this video. And it's an opportunity to ask yourself these questions. Do you really believe what they have to say? And do you trust these people? Okay, let's get going. So you are the CEO of OpenAI, 37 years old. Your company is the maker of ChatGPT, which has taken the world by storm. Why do you think it's captured people's imagination? I think people really have fun with it and they see the possibility and they see the ways this can help them, this can inspire them, this can help people create, help people learn, help people do all of these different tasks. And it is a technology that rewards experimentation and use in creative ways. So I think people are just having a good time with it and, and finding real value. So what you just said is real, is true. People are exploring it. People are being creative with it. People are starting to understand it and having fun with it at the moment. There's so many things that we can do. There's so many implementations into business and also people's personal lives. And it really is interesting to see the development. But one of the key things is the fact that this is now chat GPT four. Now, what happened to one and two? We heard about three. Most of us heard about three. If you haven't, you're already too late because now four's out and they've been building this for must be years and years. What have they been doing with this information? How have they been creating it? What, what was their main goal with this in the beginning? And what, what is their main goal now? is a, a interesting question I have. So paint a picture for us. One, five, 10 years in the future, what changes because of artificial intelligence? So part of the exciting thing here is we, we get continually surprised by the creative power of, of all of society. It's going to be the collective power and creativity and will of humanity that figures out what to do with these things. I think that word surprise though, it's both exhilarating as well as terrifying That's to people. Sure. So yeah, that word surprise. Now, if you have a surprise, it's usually because you didn't know it was coming. You didn't expect something. Now, this is the CEO of one of the biggest potential companies that's going to ever touch the earth. And for him to say surprise and not be more stern and confident in what he thinks will happen is a little bit unstabling. But let's carry on. Because on the one hand, there's all of this potential for good. On the other hand, there's a huge number of unknowns that could turn out very badly for society. What do you think about that? We, we've got to be cautious here. And, and so I just want to just highlight just something. I know I'm, I'm d jumping in and out of this in a minute. And he said, we have got to be cautious. These are the people that are in control of it right now. And they're saying that we, as in everybody, need to be cautious. These are the things that need to be really grounded and understood early enough so we can all make the right decisions and move in the right direction. And also, I, I think it doesn't work to do all this in a lab. You've got to get these products out into the world and, and make contact with reality, make our mistakes while the stakes are low. But all of that said, uh, I think people should be happy that we're a little bit scared of this 
I think people should be You're happy. a little bit scared. A little bit, yeah, You personally. Course. See, even this guy's scared. And I said this in a couple of episodes back that I was actually scared about what's happening. And this is the creator. This is the person that's about to change the world or the head of the company that's about to change the world. And he is a little bit scared. Now, if someone says they're a little bit scared, most likely they're a lot more scared than actually say they are. I think if I said I were not, you should either not trust me or be very unhappy I'm in this job. Now look at this person. Look at this guy. Look into his eyes. Would you trust him? Would you even trust him to drive you home in a taxi? Mm, I'm a bit like that with this at the minute. Um, I don't think I trust him that much, to be honest. Um, but yeah, never judge a book by its cover, but sometimes you can see in the eyes, right? <laughs> so what is the worst possible outcome? There's like a set of very bad outcomes. One thing I'm particularly worried about is that these models... Uh, could be used for uh, large-scale disinformation. I am worried that these systems, now that they're getting better at writing computer code, could be used for offensive cyber attacks. Um, and we're trying to talk about this. I think society needs time to adapt. And how confident are you that what you've built won't lead to those outcomes? Well, we'll adapt it. He said we'll adapt it. Now, how all of a sudden is he so confident in what he can do when he's talking about this system or these levels of computing and systems and networks can grow to a point that they could potentially be dangerous? Why and how are they going to be in a position to make all the rules, the rules that will impact me and you? They will have the code. We're going to be putting the key in their hands. Well, they have the key in their hands. We're not actually putting it there. They actually build their own house and now they have the key to it. You'll adapt it as negative things occur? For sure, for sure. And so putting these systems out now, while the stakes are fairly low, learning as much as we can, and feeding that into the future systems we create, uh, that tight feedback loop that we run, I think is how we avoid the more dangerous scenarios. Now, what you're saying makes sense. Learning from your mistakes, correcting them, putting it back into the system, into the feedback loop, as he called it. But already... There have been instances where people have been able to manipulate ChatGPT 3 or 3.5. And these are things that they didn't see. These are things that they weren't able to, you know, foresee happening and actually close those those loops or those back doors. So how's he going to manage it? Let's see. You're spending 24-7 with this technology. You're one of the people who built this technology. What is most concerning to you about safety? This is a very general technology. And whenever you have something so general, it is hard to know upfront um, all the capabilities, uh, all, all the potential impact of it, as well as its downfalls and the limitations of it. Can someone guide the technology to negative outcomes? The answer is yes, you could. So the answer is yes. So it can be guided. Now, I understand these people are on a path to create something and they probably feel like if they didn't create it, someone else will create it. And if they had the abilities to do it, then why not them? I understand that as humans, that's how we're programmed to develop um, or that's how we've been programmed to develop. But um, interesting. Guided to negative outcomes. And this is why we make it available initially in very constrained ways so we can learn what are these negative outcomes? What are these, um, uh, the ways in which technology could be harmful? Such as with GPT-4, we, you know, if you ask a question to GPT-4, can you help me uh, make a bomb versus the previous systems, it is much less likely to follow that guidance versus the previous systems. And so to say the previous systems were able to be manipulated to, to do that. Chat GPT-3 was out for quite a while. So who knows who may have used that already to do these things? Who knows how it's being created and being developed on different platforms. And so we're able to intervene with um, at, at the pre-training stage to make these models more likely to refuse direction or guidance that could be harmful. What's easier to predict today based on where we are, humans or machines? Which one do you think? Humans or machines are more easy to predict. Right at this point, we can say machines because we're cold in them. But how many of us as individuals that are not in this industry, who are not programmers, can predict 
what's going to happen. Even in any form of development, when you are programming, there are things that you don't really know as the programmer or as the developer that the system or the program will actually do. That's why in those scenarios, you will have the, the developers and then you will have the testers. Now the testers are put there so they can test the system. So they can see and they can try and find things that the developer didn't see. And that's like how these new technologies are. No matter how great or how good you think they are or how well you think they'll perform, when they're out there in the real world, different things can happen. Things that the developer or the creator didn't even think about. I would probably say machines because there is a scientific process to them that we we understand. Okay, so you said there's a scientific process that they understand. Yeah, we currently understand it, but where will it be in the next five years? Well, not even five years. Thinking about it, the development of everything so far has been super, super quick. Everyone's in a race to win and be the person on top. When you're in a race and you're running, sometimes you're not looking for all the, the obstacles in the way. Sometimes you can trip up. Sometimes you can run into things that you didn't think were going to be in your path. And because you're rushing around, trying to get everything done before someone else does, it creates potential issues and problems. Will they resolve those problems quick enough or will they jump ahead and say, I'm going to go back and fix that later on? So these are things that, you know, you and I need to be looking at. You and I need to be feeding back into the system. And you may think to yourself, while I'm an individual, I have no input on this. But just start to think about ways that you could be feeding back into the system in a positive way. And uh, humans are just, there's so much more nuance. Does the machine become more human-like over time? We are getting to a point where machines will be capable of a lot of the cognitive um, work that, that humans do at some point. Is there a point of no return in that process? There could be. She just said there could be a point of no return, making the human brain obsolete. One of the main things that we live and strive for each day is learning and developing and using our skills, knowledge, education, training, whatever it is to impact the world. Yes, we get up and go to work to make money, but a lot of the times we have passions for things, passions that add value to others. But if machines are the ones that will be doing everything and they can create way better than we can, what will be the point of humans? What will be the point of getting up in the morning? What would I be living for, living towards? I've heard a couple of stories about people who retire and then, you know, they go on holiday and think, oh, this is the life, sitting on the beach, drinking daiquiris every day. But then they'll get to a point where this is boring. They used to dream and think about those days that they could leave work and not have to do the mundane things and just sit on the beach all day. But in reality, when you are sitting on the beach all day, drinking daiquiris with nothing else productive to do, life becomes ish. <laughs> in the most simplest words, we want to create, we want to develop, we want to make things, we want to improve the world, we want to improve people's lives. But if technology and computers do everything for us, what is the need for humans? What would the AI and technology think about who we are? what we are. Are they going to want to serve us or will they want to serve themselves? There could be, um, but it's not obvious what that looks like today. And our goal is to make sure that we can predict as much as possible in terms of capabilities before we even develop these systems as well as limitations. So they talk about predicting the capabilities, but a lot of these, these platforms are actually building and learning from each from each other, from themselves, in improving and becoming better than they were, becoming better than the human, the human mind. Another thing, do you see a resemblance in terms of the way, the the look of that person? Another trusting face, I didn't see a smile once yet. She seems super serious, which is a good thing because she has a lot, she has a lot to manage and to be in control of, but she doesn't seem very happy to me. She looks, if you look at her face, she kind of looks a little bit worried. I'll let you be the judge of that. It's behavior is very contingent on what humans choose for its behavior to be. Therefore, the choices that humans are making and feeding into the technology will dictate what it does, at yes. least for now. Mm -hmm. so, so there are incredibly important choices being made by you and your team. Absolutely. And, and how do you decide between right and wrong? As we make a lot of progress, it becomes, these decisions become harder and they become- I just don't trust this woman, man. <laughs> She just doesn't seem confident enough to me. Looking at the eyes, looking at the face, looking at the body language, they're just not coming across as I feel 
someone who's confident enough to be in the position that they are in to be doing an interview and showing body language speaks volumes, facial expressions, the eye contact, the hand movements, many different things. I would really, it would be really interesting to see what a body language expert thinks about these two. Maybe it might come out. Maybe you might see something about that. I'll keep you in the loop and let you know. Come from more nuanced. Um, so there, there are a couple of things in terms of customization. There is a part of just making the model more capable in, in, in a way where you can customize its behavior and you can give the user a lot of um, flexibility and choice um, in having the AI that is more aligned with their own values and with their own beliefs. So, But then when your beliefs don't go with what their beliefs are, so positive or negative, there's still the ability for them to constrain or manipulate that AI that's personally for you. You know, if you have values that don't agree with their values or the values of the country or the economy or what else could we think of or the government laws, rules of the land that sometimes may conflict with your religion, your faith, your belief, who is a person that takes control of that? And should they take control of that? So so that's very important and we're working on that. And In then, other words, it's almost the future is is potentially a place where each person has their sort of own customized AI that is specific to what they care about and what they need? Within certain bounds. So there should be some broad bounds. And then the question is, what should they look like? And this is where we are working on gathering public input. What should this hard bounds look like? And we Public input. Now they're asking for public input. Why, why is that part of the process already? Why are you not get, getting around and gathering around all the people of the earth, no matter what skin color, what tone, what sex they are, and gathering their thoughts now? Why is it later on? How will they do this? How will they process this? How will they you know, get all these people together? And, how, and who's going to judge what goes in and what stays out? Within these hard bounds, you can have a lot of choice in having your own AI represent your own beliefs um, and your own values. Why do I need AI to be me? We're moving so far away from interacting with people as it is right now with all the forms of communication from text messaging, app messaging, Instagram, Facebook, and all the other email, video chat. We're now at a point where we're actually creating things that don't even exist with AI. Deep fakes are also out there causing issues right now. So why would I need a robot or a piece of technology to be me? does not make sense these people are just wanting to take control that's what it is at the end of the day now i'm saying all of this right now i'm not being too controversial i don't think so but um if this gets pulled whoever gets to watch it um keep an eye out keep an eye out for me okay because <laughs> hopefully i'll be here for next episode <laughs> anyway let's go are there negative consequences we need to be thinking about negative consequences let's see if she can actually really tie down what the negative consequences are and be real with it i got a feeling that um she's probably not gonna but uh as other videos i've seen but uh i'll give her a chance i think i think there are uh, massive potential negative consequences whenever you build something so powerful uh, with which so much good can come. Um, I think alongside it carries the possibility. She has no facial expressions. Is she actually real? Or is she a robot that we haven't seen yet that hasn't been programmed well enough to understand human facial expressions and interact in the right way? Whoa. It gets deep, people. It gets deep. ...of big harms as well. And um, that's why, you know, we exist. And that's why we're, we're trying to uh, figure out how to deploy these systems responsibly. But I think the potential for good is huge. She didn't ask you about potential for good. Yeah, you can add that in. And that's what you're going to talk about anyway. But let's talk about the dark side of it. Where's it actually going? Speak real. You know, I'm talking as if I'm talking to her right now, but I'm not. So, yeah, we got to read between the lines with these these people and see what they're really about, understand and put ourselves in the right position to make the best of what's going to happen because it's inevitable right now. There's no there's no off button. 
there's no way to switch this off. As much as they say, as you'll hear in a moment, that um, they may have control or they have control, but um, I just don't believe it. Why put this out for the world to start playing with, to start using, when we don't know where this is heading? You mean like why develop AI at all? Why develop AI in the first place? And then why put it out for the world to use before we know that we are safeguarded, that those guardrails yeah. are in place already? This will be the, the greatest technology humanity has yet developed. Did you hear this guy? This will be the greatest technology that man's developed. This guy's the owner, you know? He is so full of it right now. Um, but he's telling the truth. He is telling the absolute truth about how big this is. Let's just step back a little bit and just see what the, that question was again. Why put this out for the world to start playing with, to start using when we don't know where this is heading? You mean like why develop AI at all? Why develop AI in the first place? And then why put it out for the world to use before we know that we are safeguarded, that those guardrails yeah. are in place already? This will be the, the greatest technology humanity has yet developed. We can all have a, an incredible educator in our pocket that's customized for us, that helps us learn, that helps us do what we want. Um, we can have medical advice for everybody that is beyond what we can uh, get today. We can have creative tools that help us figure out the new problems we're going to solve, wonderful new things to co-create with this technology. My thought on that, there are so many people out in the world that can do all this already. There's so many people that can be educated and, tra and trained up if the money was spread, if the opportunities were also spread out evenly, or at least fairly. If we were to spread this out fairly around, around the world, people will be able to do all these things anyway. So now if we've got AI going to be doing it for us, those people stay where they are. I'm not in a position to grow and get out of poverty or get out of the environments that they're in and become productive members of society as they would want to be. AI is just going to come and take it all. And I know this might sound like, Rock, you're so negative right now. If you don't get to grips and start to understand where this is all going and pay attention, and I mean pay attention and that goes to anybody and everybody that's listening i may sound like i'm preaching i'm not trying to talk down to anybody but i just need people to understand that this is serious anyway back to the video for humanity uh, we have this idea of a, a co-pilot this tool that today we help people write computer code and they love it we can have that for every profession and and we can have a much higher quality of life, a stand, like standard of living. As you point out, there's a huge, uh, there is huge potential downside. People need time to update, to react, to get used to this technology, to understand where the, the, the downsides are and, and what the mitigations can be. If we just developed this in secret in our little lab here and didn't give, didn't have contact with reality and made GPT-7, and then drop that on the world all at once. That, I think, is a situation with a lot more downside. I give him a plus on that. I give him a thumbs up on that statement. That is true. If they just developed it in private and just release it to only private businesses to use, then yes, it would have a, a major negative impact on society. But at the same time, what have they been doing so far? They've only released that now so they can use people as guinea pigs, they need more data. They need people to interact with it, to learn, to learn from it. So let's get some free employees. Let's get the public to actually feed into our system, to do all the work that we cannot do with the small number of people that we have. Let's open it up to the world so anybody and everybody can work for us. Hmm. Is there a kill switch, a way to shut the whole thing down? Yes. What really happens is like any engineer can just say like, we're going to disable this for now. Absolute BS. <laughs> there, they say there's a kill switch, but there's no kill switch. That's lies, I believe, because if someone switches something off, someone's going to switch something on somewhere else. This is already out there, outside of any human individual or organization, company's control. If they had a kill switch to their system, someone else's system is still live. And who's to say when and how or if they will turn their system off? If it's a positive for them, but it could be a negative for somebody else. Anyway. Or we're going to deploy this new version of the model. A human. Yeah. 
the model itself, can it take the place of that human? Could, could it become more powerful than that human? The, uh, so in the sci-fi movies, yes. In, in, in our world, in the way we're doing things, th this model is, you know, it's sitting on a server. It waits until someone gives it an input. Now, he just related that to one of the key things that relate to this podcast, which is before Skynet, Skynet being the key word here. And they say it's sitting on a server. He's making it sound so small and it's insignificant, as if ChatGPT4 is sitting on one server in one location in one part of the world and can be switched on and off with a switch. I don't believe him. And I'm sure there's many of you out there that don't believe him because we know how these systems work. We understand that there's a redundancy. We understand there's multiple locations for these servers to be running on. They're not just going to put it in one spot. These servers are placed all the way around the world, giving people quicker access to it. Maybe some of the systems that they show us that they're working on may be in one location, but guaranteed, guaranteed, servers are all dotted around the world and that's how it is that's how all data is nowadays different companies data if they have different locations around the world they access it from a local location they don't go halfway around the world to try and get that data and bring it back it's usually stored in a local location or some type of data center that's locally in that region in that country so the fact that he's talking about they could turn it off no the other side of that is who's to say that just like the movies, that these systems can lock people out, lock people out of buildings, denying access. Most of these data centers are highly secure locations. People can't just walk in there. People can't just scale a fence. To actually get into those buildings is just like you see in the movies. But the only difference is you ain't getting in there like Arnold. They're securing billions or maybe even trillions of dollars worth of development technology they're not going to let anybody just walk in no absolutely no way that's happening so if a system decides we're going to lock humans out they'll lock us out or lock them out which locks us out and you might think to yourself well we could just plug pull the plug turn the power off all these locations have backup generators or what they call usps uninterrupted power supplies which are big batteries that will enable servers to continue to run these data centers and these locations where these devices will sit will communicate in multiple ways. They won't just communicate via cable under the ground. They'll communicate by frequencies through the air. They'll communicate with satellites in the sky. Even just saying that just makes me think that's a way of networking all across the world. If you think about when Terminator first came out, this was before the internet as we know it. Skynet internet more than just a coincidence right anyway let's keep going but you, you raise an important point which is the humans who are in control of the machine right now also have a huge amount of power we do worry a lot about authoritarian governments developing this putin has himself said whoever wins this artificial intelligence race is essentially the controller of humankind do you even Putin's saying that. So obviously everyone else is saying that that's in power. So everybody's scrambling right now to be top dog. It's going to get hairy. It's going to get super hairy. <laughs> Aye. So that was a chilling statement for sure. What I hope instead is that we successively develop more and more powerful systems. He hopes. I don't care about your hopes, to be honest. You need to be doing, not hoping. Hoping is something where it's out of your control. I hope this will happen. That means you don't have control you, you, when you are hoping something. Yeah, told you. Look at those eyes. Don't trust it. In the words of Flavor Flav. <laughs> Can't trust it. Anyway. That we can all use in different ways that get integrated into our daily lives, into the economy, and, and become an amplifier of human will. But not this autonomous system that is... The you know, single this controller yeah. essentially got. Really don't want that. What should people not be using it for right now? The thing that... I try to caution people the most is what we call the hallucinations problem. Um, the model will confidently state things as if they were facts that are entirely made up. And the more you use the model, because it's right so often, the more you come to just rely on it and, and not check like, ah, this is just a language model. Well, that's inevitable. That's going to happen. Because even now, people see something that's on Instagram or Twitter, and everyone just repeats it like it's real, like it's the truth. 
So it's about to get worse. And that's just human nature. And that's the environment that we're in right now. So I can't see that getting any better. Good luck out there. <laughs> does ChatGPT, does artificial intelligence create more truth in the world or more untruth in the world? Oh, I think we're on a trajectory for it to create much more truth in the world. If there's a bunch of misinformation fed into the model, isn't, going to, isn't it going to spit out more misinformation? Great question. I, I think the right way to think of the models that we create um, is a reasoning engine, not a fact database. They can also act as a fact database, but that's not really what's special about them. What we're training these models to do is something closer to, what we want them to do is something closer to the ability to reason, not to memorize. So if they're in a position to reason, then they should be in a position to kind of make their own choices, right? For you to reason something is for you to make a choice. And that adds to autonomy and sentient. So uh, where are we going? This guy has no idea. He's probably super smart. He probably knows how to build a business, probably knows how to be a, a great developer and do many other things. But the certain elements of this, he's not he's not the person to do it. He's a spokesman, but he ain't the person to do it. There's probably people out there that can do it or try and do it, but he isn't the person. It'd be great for them to interview the person that actually can really tell us what's really going on, what's really going to happen. But these are the people at the top and these are the people that want the fame and the power. So let's see what happens. All of these capabilities could wipe out millions of jobs. If a machine can reason, then what do you need a human for? A lot of Just what I said earlier on, wipe out millions of jobs. And even when people talk about like the truckers and why don't they learn to program if there's no truck driving jobs, ain't easy like that. People are going to find it hard to adapt to new environments. The older people get, if they haven't entered a certain market, they're going to really find it hard. The younger minded people are able to adapt more easily. Maybe I, AI can come in and help with that. Let's hope because I have no control. But collectively, maybe we can make a difference. I'm not trying to start no alliance or anything like that. So just making that clear to all the, the YouTube editors and auditors. I'm just sharing my views from what's being displayed from YouTube. So Stuff, it turns out. One of the things that we are trying to push the technology trajectory towards and also the way we build these products is to be a tool for humans, an amplifier of humans. Um, and if you look at the way people use ChatGPT, there's a pretty common arc where people hear about it the first time, they're a little bit dubious, and then someone tells them about something and then they're a little bit afraid. And then they use it. I see how this can help me. I see how this is a tool that helps me do my job better. And with every great technological revolution in human history, although it has been true that the jobs change a lot, some jobs even go away. And I'm sure we'll see a lot of that here. Human demand for new stuff, human creativity is, is limitless. And we find new jobs. We find new things to do. They're hard to imagine from where we sit today. I certainly don't know. In a first world country, that may be you know, reasonable to actually think about. But the more that we advance and we remove certain jobs that are needed from the lower levels, those are the jobs that we have been sending to other countries for years, other regions of the world for years, and has given them opportunities to grow, earn, build, support families, develop their own economies. Once we pull that away, who's going to support them? Just a thought. What they'll be. Um, but I think the future will have all sorts of wonderful new things we do that you and I uh, can't even really imagine today. He can't even imagine it. He can't even imagine what's going to be in the future. Why is this person in a position that's creating something that's so powerful, but yet can't imagine what's, what the future will look like? Doesn't that tell you that this person and these people don't have an understanding really of what's going on in the world and how they can control it? Is it about power, money, respect, notoriety, hierarchy, fame, legacy? So the speed of the change that may happen here is the part that I worry about the most. But if this happens, you know, in a single digit number of years. So he's already said he's worried about the speed, the speed of this, the speed of this change, the speed of this new technology that's coming forth now. He's not slowing it down because he's got competition. So he's got to be ahead of it. He's got to be on top of it. He's got to be pushing for the speed. So as much as he's saying he's, you know, one thing for him to be afraid of or be concerned about is the speed in which it's developing. He's the one pushing it. He's the one in the race, or they are the one in the race. So um, talking a lot of uh, BS on this one. Here's some of these shifts. That, that is the part I worry about the most. Could it tell me how to build a bomb? 
it shouldn't tell you how to do, build a bomb. But Even though Google searched, well, no, no, we put, we put constraints. So if you- Did you hear him say, no, 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 no. He's trying to get that point across, but it's possible. So if I just pull this back just a little bit so we can get the whole of that, I just wanted you to see his body language. If you look at his body language and the way he's sitting, I'm very, very in tune with body language, by the way, if he didn't, if he didn't already notice. Let's pull it back a little bit. Could it tell me how to build a bomb? It shouldn't tell you how to do, build a bomb, but even though Google searched. Well, no, no, we put, we put constraints. So if you go ask it to tell you how to build a bomb, um, our version, I don't think we'll do that. Google. Look at that. He's already name dropping his competition, trying to put them down about their technologies and what his is. But every technology will have flaws. So as much as he might you know, open up and try and share the fact that his platform doesn't do such things, but Google's does do this thing. Mm. What makes your your so great and wonderful compared to others? Be honest. They're not being honest right now. Google already does. And so it's not like this is something that technology has not already made the information available to. But I think that every incremental degree you make that easier is something to avoid. A thing that I do worry about uh, is we're not going to be the only creator of this technology. There will be other people who don't put some of the safety limits that, that we put on it. Society, I think, has a limited amount of time to figure out how to react to that, how to regulate that, how to, how to handle it. And how do you decide here at OpenAI? This is the key question. How do you decide? Let's see if he, he can actually give a real honest answer with detail as to what his plans are or what their plans are at OpenAI. What goes in, what shouldn't? We have policy teams, we have safety teams, we talk a lot to other groups in the, in the rest of the world. Um, we finished GPT-4 a very long time ago, or it feels like a very long time ago in this industry, I think like seven months ago, something like that. Um, and since then, we have been internally, externally talking to people, trying to make these decisions, working with red teamers, talking to various policy and safety experts, getting audits of the system to try to address these issues and put something out that we think is safe and good. And who should be defining those guardrails for society? Society should. One That's right, society should. But will society be doing that? Because that means input from everybody in, and anybody, no matter what their thoughts and feelings are about the world or about different people, what's right, what's wrong, without the dictation. And who should be defining those guardrails for society? Society should. One society as a whole, how are we going to do that? So. I can paint like a vision that I, I find compelling. This will be one, one way of, of many that it could go. Um, if you had representatives from major world governments, uh, you know, trusted international institutions come together and write a governing document, you know, here is what the system should do. Here's what the system shouldn't do. Here's, you know, very dangerous things that the system should never touch, even in a mode where it's creatively exploring. No in theory, that sounds... Like a good idea. We're we'll looking at the state of the world right now. When it comes to wars, when it comes to money, when it comes to organizations, company, finances, the world isn't agreeing on a lot of things right now. Countries, even inside countries, states, cities, provinces that don't agree with each other. So how are they going to create this governing document that's going to be spread? <clears throat> how are they going to create this governing? How are they going to create this governing document that's going to be input? How are they going to create this governing document that's going to use input from all over the world to create something that they all agree on? It's never happened in the past. It's never going to happen now. Definitely not going to happen now. So he can believe and paint this picture for us, but his picture doesn't, it's not worth anything. It's not a believable picture because it's never been painted before. And he doesn't have the colors to create it or the crayons. <laughs> anyway. Um, and then developers of language models like us use that as the governing document. You've said AI will likely eliminate millions of jobs. It could increase racial bias, misinformation, create machines that are smarter than all of humanity combined, and other consequences so terrible, we can't even imagine what they could be. Can you believe the person 
that's in charge of the most powerful system ever made said those words. Guaranteed, he's going to try and eat them now. Or he's not going to try and eat them. He's going to say, well, he's going to change his, he change his approach on that. Guaranteed, he's going to change his approach on that and try and say something different. But let me just rewind that for a moment so we can actually hear the words that came out of this person's mouth who's now in charge of one of the most powerful systems on the earth and potentially, and potentially create and control so much. You've said... AI will likely eliminate millions of jobs. It could increase racial bias, misinformation, create machines that are smarter than all of humanity combined, and other consequences so terrible, we can't even imagine what they could be. Many people are going to ask, why on earth did you create this technology? Why, Sam? I think it can do the opposite of all of those things, too. Properly done, it is going to eliminate a lot of current jobs. That's true we can make much better ones. So talking about the downsides, acknowledging the downsides. For one, he doesn't, he already said earlier on, he doesn't know what kind of jobs are going to be coming. He has no idea. He has no idea. He said it earlier on, he doesn't have any idea of what jobs are going to be created or what they're going to look like. But all of a sudden, he's got an answer to this question. It doesn't relate. It doesn't connect. He'll say one thing and then say something else. Switch it up to what pushes his narrative forward. Look at the body language. Does this look like someone who should be in power. Just something to think about. Is he really the person behind what's going on? Or is he just a face put in front? Anyway, I'm not trying to go down that line. So uh, I just want to pull this back one more time so we can really get real detail as to how he communicate this across. Use that as the governing document. You've said AI will likely eliminate millions of jobs. It could increase racial bias, misinformation, create machines that are smarter than all of humanity combined, and other consequences so terrible, we can't even imagine what they could be. Many people are gonna ask, why on earth did you create this technology? Why, Sam? I think it can do the opposite of all of those things too. Properly done, it is going to eliminate a lot of current jobs, that's true we can make much better ones. So talking about the downsides, acknowledging the downsides, trying to avoid those while we push in the direction of the upsides, I think that's important. And I, again, very early preview. Like, would you push a button to stop this if it meant we are no longer able to cure all diseases? Would you push a button to stop this if it meant we couldn't educate every child in the world super well? Would you push a button to stop this if it meant there was a 5% chance it would be the end of the world? I would push a button to slow it down. And in fact, I think we will need to figure out ways to slow down this technology over time. 2024, the next major election in the United States, might not be on everyone's mind, but it certainly is on yours. Is this technology going to have the kind of impact that maybe social media has had on previous elections? And how can you guarantee there won't be those kind of problems because of ChatGPT? We don't know is the honest answer. We're not. We don't know. There's a lot of things that he's saying right now that they don't know. I'm not saying they should have all the answers, but have some form of way of how you're going to deal with it. If that is the issue, how have you put in, what things have you put in place to try and mitigate the impact? Saying I don't know is not a good answer for anybody, let alone a, a 37, I think 37 year old man. Not good enough. Not good enough. Not good enough. Monitoring very closely. And, and again, we can take it back. We can turn things off. We can change the rules. Is this a Google killer? Will, no, will people say no. I'm going to chat GPT it instead of Google it no. in the future? I think if you're thinking about this as search, it's sort of the wrong framework. I have no doubt that there will be some things that people used to do on Google that they do in chat GPT, but I, I think it's a fundamentally different kind of product. Elon Musk yes. was an early investor in your company. He's since left. Um, he has called out some of the chat GPT inaccuracies. Whoa, Elon in the building. Okay, let's hear what Elon has to say. This will be interesting. And he tweeted recently, what we need is truth GPT. Is he right? I think he is right in that we want these systems to tell the truth, but I don't know the full context of that tweet and I suspect, uh, yeah, I don't think I know what it's referring to enough. Do you to... and he speak anymore? We do. And what does he say to you off, off, the Twitter. Um, I have tremendous respect for Elon. I, you know, obviously we have some different opinions about how AI should go, but I think we fundamentally agree on more than we disagree on. What do you think you agree most about? That getting this technology right 
and figuring out how to navigate the risks is super important to the future of humanity. How will you know if you got it right? One simple way is if, if most people think they're much better off. Not a good answer. You're never going to know when you get it right because you're always going to be striving for more. Always going to be striving to make it better. The only time you're going to know is when you get it wrong, when it causes death and destruction. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but potentially without the right things in place, the right laws, the right development, the right people behind the wheel steering the ship or steering the bus that everyone's on this ride for. Than they were before we put the technology out into the world. That would be an indication we got it right. You know, a lot of people think science fiction yeah. when they think ChatGPT. Can you keep it so that these are truly closed systems that don't become more powerful than we are as human beings, communicate with each other, and plan our destruction? It's so tempting to anthropomorphize ChatGPT, but I think it's important to talk about what it's not as much as what it is. And it because deep in our biology we are program to respond to someone talking to us. You talk to ChatGPT, which, you know, really you're talking to this transformer somewhere in a cloud and it's trying to predict the next word in a token and give it to you back. Um, but it's so tempting to anthropomorphize that and think that this is like an, an like anthropomorphize. Why is he using such a big word? Let me go look, look that up. Okay. So anthropomorphize attribute human characteristics or behaviors to a god, animal, or object. Examples of anthropomorphize are Disney characters like Mickey and Minnie Mouse, or a candlestick, teapot, and clock in Beauty and the Beast, the animal in George Orwell's novel Animal Farm, and brand mascots like Cheetos, Chester Cheetah. Why would you use such a word in this situation? Why not be clear and concise and honest? Yeah, it's a big word. Did it need to be used? Not really. He's supposed to be speaking to the people. I didn't even know what that word was until just a minute ago. So, um, a entity, a sentient being that I'm talking to, and it's gonna go do its own thing and have its own will and you know plan with others. But it can't. It can't. Could it? There, are, I can imagine in the far future other versions of artificial intelligence, different setups that are not a large language model that could do that. It really took a decade plus of social media being out in the world for us to sort of realize and even characterize some of the real downsides of it. How should we be measuring it here with AI? There's a number of new organizations starting, and I expect relatively soon there will be new governmental departments or commissions or groups starting. Governments. Mm. Is the government prepared for this? They are beginning to really pay attention, which I think... So they're paying attention, but they're not prepared. But you've got something that's going out as globally and potentially in a position to impact the way the world functions as it is today. Um, looks like some people are losing control of the, of the bus. The bus is going in the wrong direction right now. I think it's great. And I think this is another reason that's important to put these technologies out into the world. We really need the government's attention. We really need thoughtful policy here, and that takes a while to do. Why are you not at the forefront creating these policies already? Waiting for governments to come and do it. Set a framework from now. Start putting that together. At least when the government do get involved in it, you have enough information to share with them. Not liking the way this is going at all. This has really, really opened my eyes to really what's going on. If government could do one thing right now to protect people and protect from the downside of this technology, what should they do? The main thing I would like to see the government do today is really come up to speed quickly on understanding what's happening, get insight into the top efforts, where our capabilities are, what we're doing. Uh, and I think that could start right now. It'll are take- Are you speaking to the government? Oh yes. Or you're in regular contact? Regular contact. And do you think they get it? More and more every day. When it comes to schools, you have, th this, this technology can beat most humans at the SATs, the bar exam. How should schools be integrating this technology in a way that doesn't increase cheating, that doesn't yeah. increase laziness among students? Education is going to have to change, um, but it's happened many other times with technology. When we got the calculator, the way we taught math and what we tested students on, that totally changed. The, the promise of this technology, one of the ones that I'm most excited about, is the ability to provide individual learning great individual learning for each student. Uh, you're already seeing students using ChatGPT for this in a very primitive way to great success. And as 
companies take our technology and create dedicated platforms for this kind of learning, I think it will revolutionize education. And I think that kids that are starting the education process today, by the time they graduate from high school, are going to be like smarter and more capable than we can imagine. So Here's one key thing that is missing from individual learning. We might learn the technical, we might learn the, the, the processes of something, but we're not, they're not going to be learning how to interact with real people, how to build societies and environments and neighborhoods, friendships, partnerships with real people. So we're going to turn these the young people into robots to keep creating things, being in silos and creating and doing stuff rather than learning from other people, learning from mistakes of other people, learning from their own mistakes, because something like ChatGPT is going to be there to fix every situation. And that might be good for the development and creating products, saving lives, getting rid of certain diseases, making people stronger physically. But how does this help humanity build a disease which is out there, which has us no longer being able to communicate effectively and build friendships and relationships the way they used to be. How will this aid in that? Graduate from high school are going to be like smarter and more capable than we can imagine. It's a little better than a TI-85. It's a little better. Uh, but but it is it does put a lot of pressure on teachers to read. For example, if if they've assigned an essay, three of their students use ChatGPT to write that essay. How are they going to figure that out? I've talked to a lot of teachers about this, and it is true that it puts pressure in some ways, but for an overworked teacher to be able to say, hey, go use ChatGPT to learn this concept that you're, you're struggling with and just sort of talk back and forth. One of the new things that we showed yesterday in the GPT-4 launch is using GPT-4 to be a Socratic method educator. Um, teachers, not all, but many teachers really, really love this. They say it's totally changing the way I, I teach my students. It's the basically better. the new office hours. Yeah, Eric, it's a different, it's a different thing, um, but it is a, it is a new way to supplement learning for sure. Okay, there's part of, parts of that that now is explained a little bit more, make more sense, and can potentially be beneficial or will be beneficial. But that human interaction side of it, if we start cutting it out of every in any way we can in a person's development, we're already on the way to being more solo. And we can see that from experiences over the last two to three years with, with what happened in the world. The future looks more siloed, more solo. You have learning individually now, he's, pretend, he's talking about. There's already interaction between people as it is through social media, through gaming, through video chats. Really nowadays you see young people outside interacting and enjoying themselves and creating things out of broken pieces of wood, trees, making their own games on the street having fun running around being energetic it's happening less and less and there's more reasons for them to put a headset on pick up a phone sit in front of the computer and less reasons to be outside having fun as young people and children should do building those skills on how to communicate and navigate friendships and relationships okay so that was just my views on this topic um as it's something that's fresh and has just been released um, I really wanted to put out how I actually felt about this. Main reason being, I didn't want to be doing this podcast where I didn't show the deep and negative potentials of what's really going on. I didn't want to create a podcast where I'm talking about all the positives and how great technology is and, you know, without actually showing my own real fear and being real and honest with how my thoughts and feelings are. They're probably going to come out a lot more in many of the other videos that I do, but I'm just going to keep it real. No lies, no fakeness. And with that said, I'll see you on the next podcast. And with that said, I'll see you on the next show. And with that said, I'll see you on the next episode of Before Skynet. Five, four, three, two.